shows his love for us in that while we still we were sinners Christ died for us shall we all sing hymn number 113 be seated or kneel down. Almighty Father, look mercifully upon these your family for which our Lord Jesus Christ consented to be betrayed and given up unto the hands of sinful men and to suffer death upon the cross who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. <coughs> I welcome you all for this three-hour meditation. The sheet is given to you, kindly follow it. There would not be any announcement in between or the introduction of the speaker because you know all the speakers so well. Most of them are known to you so well. There will be no introduction or any announcement. Only hymns number would be announced. Kindly follow the sheet properly so that you will get everything 
and also the all the prayers of a prayer closing prayer all the prayers are printed at the back of the sheet which is given to you shall we all sing and hymn num hymn number 114 be seated <clears throat> the first reading is taken from the gospel according to saint luke chapter 23 verses 32 to 38 luke chapter 23 verses 32 to 38 two other men both criminals were also led out with him to be executed when they came to the place called the skull they crucified him there along with the criminals one on his right the other on his left jesus said father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing and they divided up his clothes by casting lots the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him they said he saved others let him save himself if he is god's messiah the chosen one the soldiers also came up and mocked him they offered him wine vinegar and said if you are the king of the jews save yourself there was a written notice about him which read 
this is the king of the jews now we'll meditate upon these words the meditation would be led by dr michael a very good afternoon to one and all and as we come here to ponder upon the words which the lord has spoken on this day shall we look to the lord in prayer gracious lord almighty savior we commit these words at your feet o lord let these words speak to us and be with us and help us asking this prayer in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen last words are always important for people who have been recognized and these last words of different people portray what they have in their hearts and minds and i want to read some of god's people and others whose last words have been an inspiration to many of us like dl modi said one day you will read in the newspaper that dl modi is dead don't believe a word of it i shall be more alive in that day than ever before john wesley the founder of the methodist movement said the best of all is god is with us charles spurgeon said the last word jesus died for me and one of the favorite quotes which was said by alexander the great before he died to his general he laid down three wishes and three wishes in which even till today echoes everywhere he said the first thing the first wish is let my physici- physicians my doctors alone carry my coffin second thing i desire that my coffin is transported to the grave the path leading to the graveyard shall be display of all the wealth i collected and the third wish he said is let both my hands be hanged out of the coffin the first wish why he wanted physician was that he told to the world that no doctor can cure anyone they are helpless in the front of death the second thing why he wanted all the pathway to be filled with gold was he said i have accumulated wealth but when i died this wealth could not save me and the third wish what he wanted his hands to be out and where every history student remembers these words were empty handed i came and empty handed i go the world knew me as a king who conquered the whole world but when i died i could not take anything with me these words of these great men echoes their sentiments their moods their understanding into which they have been called but the last words or the saying of jesus is different from the rest as it comes from the mouth of god in flesh that is jesus who died on the cross the seven last sayings are also the seven last words of jesus not only reveal what was most important to be our loving savior but several of them helped complete the fulfillment of the messianic prophecies about that monumentous day which was forecasted by isaiah forecasted by jeremiah and the patriarchs were waiting to see the fulfillment of the day into which it came to pass for the salvation of mankind so good friday is not a sad friday some of us come with a dull faces telling that this good friday is three the basic problem for many of us is maybe what makes us sad is this is the longest church in the time in the whole year where we have to sit 3 hours inside and that makes us more sad than the words of the lord but i want to tell you that this good friday is a day where we as the body of christ need to rejoice that the words of jesus were spoken in the context where he wanted to give us life the last words are very revealing in every brief utterances jesus proclaimed a beautiful synopsis of the gospel it reflects the priority of christ and the beautiful reflection of his character for the information of the church it is believed 
that the early tradition had even tried to add another word to this list of saying. And that is the list which have been made into eight, but something the early church didn't want to, is when the soldier pierced his side and the story goes on to say, Jesus looked at the soldier and said, friend, there is a shorter road to my heart than this. But the early church found that this was impossible to be placed because Jesus had already died when the soldier pierced into his side. The agreement of all the evangelists that the execution of Jesus was carried out at the command of the Roman governor accords fully with the statement in John 18.31 in which the Jew says to Pontius Pilate, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death since capital punishment was forbidden to the Jews. And since supreme legal authority had been vested in the governor, capital cases had to be tried by him, that's the governor, and it was he who had to pass a judgment. It is believed that the hatredness towards Jesus was more from the Judean and Jerusalem community than the Galilean community. The Sandrian delivered Jesus over to the governor at night so that he could pronounce the capital punishment which is against the Misna, the foundational document of the rabbinic tradition, which directs that the Sandrian has to try capital punishment only during the day and not night. This itself is a violation. The way Jesus was handed down into the hands of Cyphus, Ananias, and then gone into the hands of Herod, and Chris goes back to Pilate itself says, that his trial was a violation both for the Jews and for all the entire community the Roman was seeing into. It was basically the minority high priest who incited the majority Jews to shout out, crucify him. This was completely orchestrated into the hands in which Jesus didn't want to defend himself. Jesus was tried on many fronts before the Sandrin before Herod, and lastly, before Pilate. And there are very interesting stories I want to tell you, which will take a long time about Pilate. They say the early church, during the formation of the New Testament, were trying to protect Pilate. And that is why we can see very clearly in which the tradition speaks, that Pilate tried to rescue, but had to give into the hands of the Jewish crowd. It is interesting to note that according to the apocryphal gospel of Peter, it was not Pilate, but Herod who pronounced a sentence to Jesus. So both the Jews and Herod refused to wash their hands, thereby openly acknowledging their responsibility. Even the early church father called Tertullian, he goes on to say that Pilate was a secret Christian. And even the Christian legends claim that Pilate became a martyr, giving his life for Christ. Even the church in Ethiopia reversed Pilate as a saint. It is in such early context that we are trying to understand the seven sayings of Jesus. And the tradition goes on and on and on, which I don't want to proceed, but trying to tell the background, the context in which Jesus was put onto the cross in Golgotha. Crucifixion was an important method of capital punishment, especially particularly among the Persians, Seleucids, they are the Parthians, Carthanids, and the Romans from about the 6th century BC to the 4th century CE. But Constantine the Great, the first Christian emperor, abolished it in the Roman Empire in the early 4th century CE because of his veneration to Christ. So this form of humiliation this form of capital punishment was not only followed by the Romans, but even were followed by others before Romans. So before the darkness descended upon the tragic scene, Jesus spoke in loud voices. And there I want to go into the first saying into which Jesus said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. For Jesus to pray under such circumstances is perhaps the most amazing thing about his first word. The people around the cross did knew very less of forgiveness of injuries. 
the romans worshiped revenge as a god eye for an eye tooth for a tooth and blood for blood was the shout of the jewish world or the people who followed the torah and i think still sometimes we love this torah very much when it comes for an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth which we are unable to forgive others we the new testament church are sometimes following this law very closely than the words of jesus it was usual for a victim of that dread doom friends painful to shriek and to curse and to spit the spectators this was a usual way when people were put on the cross and the humiliation and the pain made them to curse the people who were staying down but surprisingly jesus prayed jesus could find getsemani at golgotha that was the strength of this man who was put to cross in the midst of all the suffering jesus did not lose his faith composure and prayed father forgive them and he knew his mission and he knew where he stood with his father you luke used unexpected verb tense when he wrote jesus said father forgive them because he says the word tense of the word said expresses continuous a repeated action that means jesus was going on telling on the cross that lord please forgive them jesus went on saying forgive them on them when he was nailed when he was put the thorns while he was carrying the only word luke says is he is saying lord forgive them jesus was not complaining on the cross he was not asking his father to vindicate him of this pain but he was looking at the people and when he said to the women there those who were trying to help him he said women cry for yourselves don't cry for me because you don't know what the end lies if you are not in the state of receiving me matthew 6:21 says forgive our debt as we have forgiven our debtors we need to forgive to be forgiven when jesus prayed for forgiveness it does not mean forgiveness for all known sins others have done rather than sins of ignorance sometimes i hear people saying that when jesus prayed for the forgiveness he prayed for everyone no he is not praying for everything he is praying for those who have done it in ignorance this statement doesn't mean that everyone is forgiven nor does it mean ignorance ignorance brings forgiveness ignorance is no value in the sight of law i don't think this prayer is prayer for judas judas knew very well who jesus was i am also very sure that this prayer of forgiveness may not be for pilate because pilate also knew very well the leader and jesus who was innocent but he didn't want to be right deliberately he succumbed to the pressure of the crowd but the prayer was for those who didn't knew him and mocked him they are the soldiers who humiliated him in the public the gatherings where they were standing and spitting upon him and throwing challenges to him those who put the crown of thorns on his head those who blindfolded him and asked him to prophesy as such forgiveness of the cross is not for people who are abusing the meaning of forgiveness it is for those who stands sin with ignorance into which they have done any sin which is done deliberately will have a consequence a sin of ignorance can be forgiven a sin of deliberateness is something which is costly to be restored and their forgiveness becomes very costly for anyone in acts 3:17-19 now fellow israelites i know that you have acted in ignorance this is what peter says as you did in your leader but this is how god fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets saying that his messiah will suffer repent then and turn to god so that your sins may be wiped out that the times of refreshing may come from the lord that is what exactly peter told to the church that your sins of ignorance are forgiven but you need to repent into which you have done it is only the courageous who can forgive forgiveness demands an unconditional love which is there in luke 747 but who has been forgiven little loves little means who has been forgiven much loves much act of forgiveness is an act of worship forgiveness is surrendering to god 
are we in that position to surrender ourselves to that extent where we are asked to forgive there are times where we don't want to forgive a true act also because it doesn't suit to our minds and to our thinking but jesus is asking from the cross the first thing if you accept me you accept me on the cross with the words of forgiveness otherwise your life and your spirituality doesn't match to my living forgiveness should lead us to trust the person not hate them later and sometimes these words are very true when we say that i have forgiven you but i still remember your name you can forgive your enemy but still you ponder them in your heart and in your name and that is not a true forgiveness into which they stand by forgiving others we do not validate or accept their wrong doings that is something which i have heard you telling me pastor we have forgiven but does it mean that we have forgiven their wrong doings no it doesn't mean that you are forgiving their wrong doings but at the same time we are not being judgmental by unforgiving them because the lord has commanded it very clearly that as i have forgiven you you need to forgive others and that stands unconditional matthew 18:15 if your brother sins against you go and show him his fault it doesn't mean that when you forgive someone who has harmed you you don't need to go and say that that person is wrong these are the different interpretations of forgiveness which we in the contemporary world need to understand it is easy to love people like jesus but difficult to forgive people like judas god calls us to forgive judas in our lives it's easy to love people like jesus but very difficult to love people like judas and where we stand as how we forgive others in our lives this love which the lord has commanded is not optional but compulsory it's a command and the, i leave with the church the word that please do not postpone your forgiveness the clever way of unforgiving people is that they want to postpone forgiveness and say that i have forgiven only by words may the lord bless this words words Shall we all stand and sing hymn number 116?
please be seated the second reading is taken from st luke chapter 23 verses 39 to 43 one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him aren't you the christ save yourself and us but the other criminal rebuked him don't you fear god he said since you are under the same sentence we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve but this man has done nothing wrong then he said jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom jesus answered him i tell you the truth today you will be with me in paradise this is the word of the lord let's look into the second meditation into which the lord was speaking from and this is also a meditation where we are talking about how jesus was dealing with two people with him who were crucified it was not a situation where a time of confession it was a situation that all the three were punished equally equal punishment equal pain equal humiliation and in that context how both of them who were the two thieves who were hanging one on the left and one on the right both of them have a different opinion jesus was hanged in between two thieves they could have been put the two thieves together in fact that would have been a natural thing to do for the soldiers but we believe that these two thieves were two partners in the same crime or a different crime and they should have been put together but the soldiers wanted to keep jesus in between two of them to identify and make them to know the world that he is also like one of them the prophecy which was fulfilled in isaiah 53:12 is coming to pass here he was numbered with transgressors and with him they crucify two thieves the one on the right and the one on the left and the scripture was fulfilled and said and he was numbered with transgressors need to remember that at calvary not only was the hand of man at work but need to understand all the more the hand of god was coming to pass the prophecies were coming to pass the thieves could hear what jesus was praying before them there was a prayer which was prayed by jesus and the distance between the crosses may not may not have been that far and even could read the language in three languages it was written on jesus the board which clearly said this is jesus of nazareth the king of the jews this is a sarcastic way of the roman governor to put forward this is your king in which and they read that language because i am sure that these thieves could read at least one of the languages which they were put they also heard the soldiers mocking and also people around the cross mocking at jesus only one thief spoke to jesus and which he stood with his confession aren't you the king one said if you could save yourself why can't you save us the robbers was a part of the mob who also may have heard the insult at him when we can't come out of a situation there are times we try to taunt god and say that god has put us in this situation the other thief who was there rebuked him don't you fear god if we have fear of god why would have sin the thief surrounding were against the belief and his conviction but jesus was tried as a criminal wearing a crown going through these abuses and still one of the thieves could find the messiah in which jesus was hanging the situation didn't change his conviction of the thief he realized that something is wrong with him when he saw jesus wrong situation sometimes makes us to realize that what we have done may be wrong this was one of the important confession maybe jesus was suffering but when he saw the thief he understood that 
there was some genuine reason into which this man was confessing and asking forgiveness because i said it earlier three were tried in the same way and the thief found no relief when he saw jesus jesus was not performing a miraculous act he was not healing a leper he was not feeding a 5000 he was being tried as a criminal and to find a savior in a criminal in that situation was something of a confession into which this man was realization is an important aspect of our faith journey are we able to realize our sin or are we very busy comparing which thief do we belong to no this early church has put all these things making the church to understand please choose which thief you belong to how do you realize your sin and what leads to your confession into the thing the disciples realized jesus resurrection only after the thief realized and said that you are messiah that means the thief was before the disciples who could realize jesus on the cross as a messiah it's a very powerful confession the thief's word remember me shows his humbleness he didn't ask like a thief does the thief admitted that he was a sinner he admitted that he was getting punished for the wrong things and the deserve what he needs to be done do we have the courage to give up something wrong that we did in our lives it is only at that situation sometimes many times we don't realize what is the importance of confession what is the importance of realization and i go on telling to friends that there are two very powerful important aspects of our spiritual life one is forgiveness another is confession these becomes the paramount of our faith in the lord the thief was prayer was not asking christ to put him down from the cross and to relieve him from the pain he was asking the lord that allow me to be a part of your kingdom allow me to be a part of your place where i will be accepted as a thief who has confessed and who has come to be saved i am not a saint into which i stand people are worried about their past sin what about our present condition god's forgiveness is greater than the criminal's plea for forgiveness god's act of mercy was greater than the plea of forgiveness into which it stands and that is a place where we need to understand that how the thief was able to understand into relation in which he was standing with the lord need to come to the cross as we are corrupt as we have sinned and that we ourselves cannot come out from this problem as we cannot come out from this disorder it is only god who can save us from such a situation into which we stand repentance is realization and there cannot be a greater power than realization the thief was unwanted a misfit he realized that this was a situation where jesus could change it realization led to such a victorious and very peaceful death of this thief on the cross there are many arguments when the thief said let me be a part of your kingdom or let me be a part of paradise many argumenters say that when the thief said that jesus that let me be a part of your kingdom he didn't mean to say that be a part of heaven but he wanted to say that at this stage into which i hang allow me to be a part of your physical kingdom as i am suffering into which i am going through realization made him to understand that he needs jesus in his life and it is only at this realization that he found jesus at the very last moment of his life church it's very important for us to understand that we need to be a part of the kingdom only through our confession it is when we realize that we may have to be like one of the defaulters confessing our sins and coming into the presence of the lord that is finding the true salvation of our lives but we need to choose as one of the thieves did not confess and the other confessed as to which party do we belong to are we having the right relation with the lord have we realize that we have fallen short of his grace and we need to realize this grace very soon 
before the time is out. And this is the place where the thief realized and confessed his sin. He was honest. The important thing of a confession is that we need to be honest before God. We cannot come with a hypocritical way that the Lord may remove some part of our sin and allow us to practice the other part. Total confession demands total surrendering of our lives in the situation in which we are. I hope we understand that the words of this thief was not words of just liberation, but words of deliverance. Deliverance from our pain, deliverance from our struggles, deliverance from our suffering, and that can only be done through Jesus. May the good Lord bless this holy word. Shall we all stand and sing hymn number 118?
Please be seated. The third reading is taken from the book of St. John, chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. St. John, chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Woman, behold her son, behold your mother. Verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. This is the word of the Lord. This comes as a saying in the context where Jesus was looking at his role as a son to the parent or to the families. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved, that had other tradition says it's John, he told them and told to the woman simultaneously and to Mary, that woman, here is your son and to the disciple, here is your mother. Mary underwent a lot of pain from the time Jesus' birth to the cross. Luke 2, 34 to 35, Simon tells very clearly to Mary that <clears throat> a sword will pierce your own soul too. So the preparation of Mary to understand the role of this prophetical, miraculous son was something which is beyond her mind or cognitive mind to understand as to what the role of Jesus was in this context when he came through him. All the disciples ran away, but only women and some of the disciples of Jesus were near to the cross. And there are many traditions and many questions asked that how Jesus was treating his family how Jesus saw his family. This was the same family which in a way were not standing with him when he was famous. We read in the book of John that his brothers and everyone were telling to Jesus very clearly that why do you want to stay with us? You go to the world and show that how great you are because if you are doing this miracle hidingly, then you will not become great. You see that suspiciousness or you see that sarcasm in their tone when they were not happy with Jesus himself. So here you find Jesus all alone with his disciples and where Mary also was a part of the discipling. Jesus recognized the pain of Mary. Jesus understood the pain of a mother. He respected her. But still it tells to all the women. Jesus' addressing to the woman is not to dis disrespect Mary. It is telling to everyone at the cross that we belong to a family. By handing over Mary to John, Jesus created a family. Jesus died on the cross, but at the same time, he remembered his responsibility, that we can live and live as a family. Jesus did not want a separated family, but a united family, a family which he joined through his cross. We need to understand that this was not an ordinary family which he has joined. And there are doubts which say that could be Mary was not staying with the disciples. But at the same time, when Jesus knew that he is not going to be physically with Mary, he created a family. He made sure that Mary understood what it means to have a family into which it stood. And even the disciples. <clears throat> Jesus wanted them, the disciples, to grow with him through a family bond. And that is the place where we understand that Jesus was also on the cross giving importance to the church that they need to have a family. We cannot have a problematic family and grow in the Lord. Good family life will lead to good 
spiritual life. That is one of the important aspects where we need to understand as a church why Jesus was handing over Mary to the disciples. Joshua 24, 15, it says very clearly, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Unity in the heart and the mind of the family need to be very important. It's Christian life is about a family, making choices as a family. Is our family right with the Lord? Are we living in right relation with the Lord? Or are we living in isolation into which we stand? One of the biggest challenges today we find in the church is also that the family in which we belong is not in proper order. Many, many homes are getting filled with old people. Many, many places of orphan centers are flourishing in a very strong way. It is because sometimes the contemporary world, the globalized world is looking for individualism than for a family. We need to set our family in order to set our relation in Christ in order. There is a tension between love and duty to people and love and duty to God. Adam had to make a choice whether he would choose Eve's fruit or he would be faithful to God. Matthew 8, 21, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Let the dead bury the dead. Je Jesus didn't allow everyone to be his disciples. To some he allowed and to some he asked them to go back. We can be followers of Christ but still not be a disciple. Difference between a follower and a disciple is very much into which Jesus was looking. When God calls us sometimes, a family becomes a hindrance. Jesus always honored the family. Mary pushed Jesus to do a miracle. Though Jesus said to Mary, this is still yet my time is yet to come, but he honored his word. Though Jesus was found at the temple away from the family for many days, when Mary came and the family came and said, why were you away? Jesus very, very willingly went with them and went back home. How do we give importance to our family is a paramount in the context in which we are living. How do we understand that we are needing to have a relationship right with our family and right with God is a very, very important thing. The peace that passeth all the understanding is a very important aspect of our relation with the Lord. And that peace in the house also a very important aspect in our lives. If there is no peace in the house, then naturally our relation with God will always be disturbed into which we are going. Jesus didn't send Mary to her earthly home, but was sent to a greater family, a family of God, a family which was built with the disciples. Though Jesus had other brothers like James and Joseph, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. But Jesus handed over his mother to the beloved disciple John, into which we are saying, do we have a special relation with special responsibility? Special relation is given to special people into which we need to stand. Jesus, by calling woman, does not disrespect her, but to make her understand that her son is also a savior. Mary lost her son, but found a savior in him. Luke 2.41 says, he told his parents that he was in his father's house. Matthew 12.50 for whoever does the will of the Father in heaven is my brother and sister. For Jesus to have a physical family was something which he was treating with a lot of respect. But at the same time, he did not lose focus of the calling in which he was standing. There was a tremendous amount of pain and agony when Jesus was suffering on the cross. But in spite of all the pain, in spite of all the responsibility, in spite of all the grief, he could notice his mother. He could notice his loved ones. We have many challenges. We go through different challenges. There are times, again I say that, are we respecting our family, our loved and dear ones in the right way? To build a right relation with the Lord, the Lord on the cross was telling to the church, get right with your family. Make the right decisions as family. It's a priority to worship the Lord when we have a proper relation in the family and with our loved ones. Are children able to love their parents? Are parents able to love their children? This is a very big question which even the cross is even asking us on the Good Friday. 
Many of us may be surprised why the pastor is putting this emphasis. Because I am seeing many, many Christian broken families which they are unable to mend and join together. And this hatredness is killing the church. These differences in the family is killing the church. Pietism in the early times emphasized that church begins in a home. Right relationship in the home leads to right relationship in the church. And Jesus very strongly has pointed out when he handed over his mother to the disciples. May the Lord, good Lord, bless this holy word. Now the choir will sing a special number for us. Ivory Palaces. That is the title of the song that we are about to sing. It was composed by Henry Baraclaw about a century back. Psalms 45 and verse 8 is the inspiration behind this song. It pictures Christ coming out of the ivory palaces of heaven to redeem this world. It pictures Christ clothed in garments that are perfumed with myrrh, aloes, and cassia. All of these spices were used to prepare the oil that is used for anointing the priests and the king. And Jesus Christ is our high priest and is our king of kings. All these spices speak of the surpassing fragrance of the person and work of our Lord with special reference to his suffering and death. May the fragrance of our Lord Jesus Christ, which carries the message of his love, his life, his hope, abide in our hearts forever.
The fourth reading is taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 27, verses 45 to 49. This is found on page 852 of the Family Devotional Bible. Matthew, chapter 27, verses 45 to 49. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of, these, when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he is calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. This is the word of God. This is the fourth saying of the Lord, and this is a place where we understand that how the Lord was struggling into the context which he was being put into. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The first, if we look into all the seven sayings, the first three sayings, they say it's horizontal, and the remaining four sayings are vertical to the Lord and to the cry. And you are able to see there is a dramatic change which was taking place at Golgotha. Now that was a place where it was not only the spiritual which was being controlled but the atmosphere there was changing. When Jesus uttered his fourth word from the cross, the scene was changing dramatically. The first three sayings were spoken before darkness and the fourth saying was from the darkness and that was changing the scenario. John tells us it was the ninth hour or about three o'clock in the afternoon. Jewish timings are first hour, second hour, morning six to nine, twelve, three, it goes in that way. A miraculous darkness has descended upon Golgotha. Some believe that Jesus was quoting from Psalm number 22, which he learned from childhood. But this cannot be proven as Jesus was fulfilling that Psalm prophetical verse. Years before he had inspired his type David, the king, to utter it as a prophecy in 22 of his agony for the sins of men. It is said that Martin Luther once set himself to study this profound saying of Jesus. For a long time he continued without food, in deepest meditation, and in one position of his chair. When at length he arose from his thoughts, he was heard to explain in amazement, God forsaken God, what can understand that? He was surprised and he jumped and he said, God has forsaken God, who can understand that? That is exactly the mystery of the saying. And I want to put forward to you three mysteries. The darkness of sympathy. When I say it is sympathy, is the creator was dying on the cross. And all the creation was suffering with the creator. Need to remember that when first man and woman sinned, what they did affected was the creation. God forgive their sin, but he could not deliver them from the sad consequences of their sin. The consequences we experience even till today. Adam had to sweat daily for his bread. The toil of his life was the consequence of his sin. And as they till the ground, they would comfort thorns and barriers. Death came to the scene. The creation was suffering for human sin. Everything in creation obeys God except human beings. Humans are given the freedom to choose and this choice is used by evil to entrap us and to alienate us from God. God tells the rain where to fall and it obeys. <clears throat> tells the wind to blow and it obeys. 
God tells humans what to do and humans disobey. The way Jesus controlled the storm, everyone understood and questioned how he has authority upon the whole of the creation. According to Romans 8, all creation is groaning and traveling in pain together. Why? It is awaiting the coming of the Savior, the Creator, to set them free. The creation in a way sympathized with the Creator. When Jesus died, he did re redeem the creation also. Man made thorns and put on his head and mocked him. But really, that crown of thorns was symbolic of what he did. He took our sins on the cross and broke the power of sin forever. And that was the darkness of sympathy in which it stood. Next, the darkness of solemnity. The darkness at the cross was the darkness of solemnity. The just died for the unjust. The innocent lamb died for the sinners. And in the book of Exodus, there was a great darkness. The nine plagues which God sent to Egypt was three days of pitch darkness. The darkness was so thick that they could feel it almost very near. There was darkness over Egypt before the final judgment of Passover and even the death of the firstborn. So darkness is not something new in the New Testament. It is also darkness which was there in the Old Testament and into the scene where God was pronouncing his judgment upon the Egyptian in which they were saying. Behold the Lord Jesus Christ in three hours of darkness. I wonder if God was saying that this was an hour of solemn judgment. Now is the judgment of the world, Jesus said. I shall be lifted up and draw all men unto me. Our Lord's death on the cross was very solemn, serious and holy event. The darkness of solemnity, the lamb dying for our sins. The Bible also talks about the outer darkness for hell. Some of us are very uncomfortable with this topic of hell. And I've heard many people say, Pastor, talk anything but don't talk of hell. I know it's very eminent, but I don't want it immediate. I want to listen to me, listen to it after I enjoy my life and then you give me the lecture of hell. But that is the reality. That is the reality the Lord was speaking. The darkness is very much imminent. Are we in the family of the Lord to overcome this darkness into which it stands? No one can escape death. Death is inevitable. But the cross has proclaimed, O oh death, where is your sting? And that is what the Old Test New Testament teaches. That, that is what Jesus was saying. Don't disturb the person. He or she is sleeping. The third thing, the darkness of secrecy. In those three hours, Christ was accomplishing a great work that he alone could do it. In the Old Testament, the high priest once a year went alone into the Holy of the Holy to offer the sacrifice. And the words are very clear on the wall. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God could not find anyone who could be the sacrifice of secrecy for the humanity and he became flesh and dwelt upon us. Jesus on the cross was carrying out an eternal transaction with his father. The sin was put on Jesus, created the schasm between Jesus and God. The cry of Jesus, Elo, Elo, Sabbath, Sani, why Lord, why Lord, or my father, why have you been separated from me? The cry was very real. The son was calling to his father. And that was the pain of Jesus when he was there. He could bear all pain. He could bear all suffering. But he couldn't bear the separation from his father. Sin separated man from God and man from himself. Like the prodigal son came to himself in Luke 15, 17. God doesn't abandon us, but we don't feel his presence because the darkness around us and the darkness within us. If God leaves us for a second, we will be destroyed. Because his mercies, because of his mercies, we are not consumed. Jesus could not bear the separation from the Father, but he had to bear it before because of our sin. Are we comfortable with our sin in our lives? Do we understand that because of sin that we are separated from God? 
are we very happy in our comfort zone thinking that that i am fine with my lord i am fine with my family i have my secured financial bank accounts i have everything secured for my life i don't need anything in my life other than what i am getting and i have heard many arguments telling that is not this a blessing sometimes this may be a blessing in curse we don't give importance to understand that whether we are right with god or not whether we are living in right accordance or not we take our spiritual life very very casually because we say that i am a regular church goer i give my tithe i do everything right and that is exactly what the pharisees said during that day and jesus was completely against the pharisees because they were too dogmatic they saw everything with the law but they were not seeing everything with the spirit and with obedience to the law they found comfort through their righteous action is our action comforting our lives that is a very very important question which jesus was crying and putting it before his father that why have you separated from me i have come to do your work i need you at this hour when i am carrying the cross at this hour when i am pain i have no one you have i am not feeling you in my life this the important miracle which jesus did of driving out the evil spirit jesus sent out the evil spirit into the pigs and the pigs killed themselves because the evil was with them and i have heard commentators writing that we human beings the pigs are sometimes better than human beings we enjoy with this sin we live with this sin but the animal did not want to live with that sin the animal did not want to live with that evil and they killed themselves drowned with them because they understood that something evil has come upon them again the question comes are we having the right relation with the lord are we able to understand that we may not be in the right relationship we need the lord not the sin the sin which has separated from us from the lord sometimes is the biggest hindrance of our lives and like that of the thief on the cross we sometimes blame god that because my situation is this because god is not hearing me we are in our comfort zone we need to come out of the comfort zone we need to understand that the lord is very serious with our relationship with him if jesus could not bear one second of separation are we able to bear that separation or are we happy with that separation telling that i don't want the lord i am very very happy in what i am the lord is speaking to us in a very very strong way if we are not if we are still carrying the sins in our lives and we think that the lord is with us we we are in the biggest assumptions of our spiritual life and all this will come to an end when the final judgment comes we can't run from it we can't deny it we can't say anything at that moment this is the time for us to confess this is a time for us to get things right with our lord i don't mean to say that every one of us are perfect but yes our god is perfect we need to come with that imperfectness we need to come with that sin and say lord i cannot bear your separation i cannot bear you not being with me i am tired carrying this cross and the lord says take my cross my cross is much lighter than the cross which you are carrying if we are carrying that cross if we are feeling that pain in our hearts for years after years for days after days that something in my life is not going right i need to confess to the lord i need to come to his presence remember jesus could not bear without god for a second his cry was a cry of a shrill which shook humanity which shook all the soldiers around seeing jesus giving that shrill and calling father they were thinking that god will descend elijah will descend they were looking in that way to the heavens today that cry is very real to us are we able to cry in god's presence and say lord i am separated i need to be reconciled may the good lord bless his word shall we all stand and sing the hymn which is given to us in the sheet 
ஓல்ட் ரெக்கார்ட் கிராஸ்
let us pray. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. Almighty God, creator of the world, we ask you to accept these offerings for the glory of your name and the good of your people through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the fifth reading. The fifth reading is taken from Book of Psalms, chapter 69, verse 19 to 21. And it's found on page number 500 from the Family Devotional Study Bible. You know how I am scorned, disgraced and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall on my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Another verse is taken from Book of St. John's, chapter 19, verse 28 to 29, and found on page number 229. The death of Jesus. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked the sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of hypsop plant, and filled it with, filled it with, lifted it to Jesus. Thank you. These are the verses. May God bless them. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Refresh us, Lord, this afternoon. Descend on us, Holy Spirit, like the fresh morning dew and like a soft welcome breeze. Blow upon our ears and eyes, our minds and our hearts, that we might be quickened to listen to see, to understand, and to obey. Amen. Whenever we think of Jesus Christ, we come across a number of amazing paradoxes or contradicting images. He is the lion and the lamb, the powerful lion of Judah, and the helpless lamb led to the slaughter. He comes across as the king and the servant, the one with authority, and yet the one who emptied himself. He is both man and God, not 50-50, but 100% man and 100% God. And here, on the cross, we see another paradox. He who is the living water cries out, I thirst. Let us explore this paradox and what it means to us briefly this afternoon. Hymn 120, which we usually sing for this verse, we have not sung today. 
but maybe you could keep it open so that we can see some of the words which I have used in my message. When we look at verse 1, we read, His are the thousand sparkling rills that from a thousand fountains burst and fill with music all the hills, and yet he saith, I thirst. So let us take a fresh look at the cross. There he hangs, our Lord Jesus, clearly about to die. Every breath now is a huge effort. He is heaving, gasping, fighting for oxygen, resting upon the nail holes while he inhales. Sweat is pouring off of him. Some guttural sounds are coming from his throat. The experienced soldiers had heard it before. This is the death rattle. The end is near. And the Lord brings out this word very softly, I'm sure, because they were standing close, the soldiers heard it. And in Greek, it is just one word, dipsa. In English, it is I thirst. So as we heard read, the soldiers take a sponge, they dip it into sour vinegar wine and lift it to his lips. This vinegar wine, wine is a cheap drink and the Roman soldiers often carried it to help them get through their gruesome task. And as Jesus licked the sponge, a few drops of sour vinegar would have fallen on his lips. And they would have moistened his cracked lips, the parched throat, the swollen tongue, so that just enough so he could speak out the remaining words. And we read in John's Gospel where he records that this fulfilled the scripture. Psalm 22:15, my strength is dried up like a piece of pottery and my tongue clings to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of death. And we heard read Psalm 69, they also gave me a bitter herb in my food and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And then, knowing that these prophecies are fulfilled, the Lord says, I thirst. And just to help us focus on this word, I'm going to bring out three descriptions of this word. First, it was a word of suffering, deep physical suffering. The seven words we meditated, we are meditating upon today, this out of all of them is the only one which deals with his personal, physical suffering. And when we go again to hymn 120 and take a look at verse 2, we see, all fiery pangs on battlefields, on fever beds where sick men toss, are in the human cry, he yields to anguish on the cross. Our Lord Jesus experienced anguish, terrible, terrible pain. Twelve hours have passed since he was arrested from the Garden of Gethsemane. And so many things were done to him. He was slapped, he was pushed around, mocked, spit upon, crowned with thorns that went into his scalp, scourged until his back was shredded. They took his beard and ripped it out. They beat him and they beat him again. Carrying the cross, he reaches there and into his hands and feet are driven the sharp, huge nails. Not for one second did he have rest. 
Not for one moment had anybody offered him food or drink except for that wine earlier. When Jesus hung on the cross, he was caked with blood, maimed, disfigured, a broken version of a human being. How can this be? He is the divine son, the Lord of glory, the second person of the blessed trinity, infinite, eternal, unchangeable. But yes, he is the same hanging on that cross. And that doesn't for a moment minimize who he is. In fact, it adds a layer of wonder, a wonder how this God of the universe became this figure on the cross. Why did he do it? Why, after all, should he endure it? Why should the Lord of the waters thirst, we might ask. And the answer is, in part, it had to do with his decision his choice, his determination to fulfill the mission which was given to him by the Father, the mission for which he came. And that's the second thing I want us to see. That is, these are words of submission, where he totally submitted to the will of the Father. No matter the cost, no matter the pain, he said, that he would submit even to the point of death, death on the cross. And when we look at the third picture, it is the words, I thirst, is also a word of substitution. On the night of his betrayal, while Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane, it was one thing he was struggling with, he was praying, pouring out sweat, almost like drops of blood. And he cries out to the Father, if it is possible, let this cup be removed from me. This cup of suffering. He had a clear understanding what it would be like. But then, after wrestling, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. And this cup is a picture, a symbol of the wrath of God poured out upon all the sin. The sin laid upon the sinless Lamb of God. And that is the cup which he had to drink to the dregs on the cross to accomplish what the Lord, his Father, had sent him for. And here at the cross, as he is drinking it down, we see the prophecy from Isaiah 53 fulfilled. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so we see in hymn 120 verse three says, but more than pains that racked him then was the deep longing thirst divine, that thirsted for the souls of men, dear Lord, and one was mine. The plan for our salvation included suffering, it included submission, it included substitution. The cross and the sacrifice bought for us forgiveness and salvation. It is accomplished and available, but it doesn't end there. Let us look at the last verse of the hymn. I have just interchanged the order of the lines. That parched dry lip, that fading face, that thirst were all for me. 
O love most patient, give me grace. Make all my soul a thirst for thee. So our response to this huge task of pain, of suffering, of submission, of substitution is make all my soul a thirst for thee. Are we thirsty for the Lord today? Thirsty for the things of the Lord. We live busy lives. Today people actually download an app onto their smartphones to remind them to drink water. What if we had an app which would remind us every morning to identify with David and cry out in his words, Psalm 63 verse 1, You God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. And we lean into that verse throughout the day. Or the words of Psalm 42, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. That we can keep repeating it and feeling it. How long has it been since we thirsted for the Lord with all our being? And then the Lord, I'm going to focus on one verse in John 7, 37. He declares, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. May we pray, Lord, make my whole being, my soul, thirst for you, for a living, growing, intimate relationship with you. Can we come to the cross and say, Lord, thank you for what you did for me. Your suffering, your submission, your substitution. I am thirsty for you and the living water you offer. When we do that, the Lord will fill us with his presence and with the living water the Holy Spirit, and out of our lives will flow rivers of living water. I want to close by reading a few verses from Revelation 22. Behold, I am quick, coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to reward each one as his work deserves. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without cost. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. And may our response be, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Hymn number 122.
please be seated. The sixth reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 11 to 12, found in the Family Devotional Study Bible on page number 628, and John chapter 19, verse 30, found on page number 929. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. John chapter 19 verse 20, 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Father, we pray that as we sit here, we will not be just spectators of the cross, but you will enable us to be disciples of the cross. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, We call this day Good Friday, a wonderful day. And uh, Dr. Michael has already reminded us often of the day itself. As I was thinking of why do we say it's Good Friday when everything that preceded was only sadness, shame, nothing was good in that. When we look at how God the Father even had to separate himself from his son when he was hanging on the cross, what is good? And then when we come to the sixth word, it is finished. In English, it's three words. In the original, it's one word, tetelestai. It means a word which indicates that the work of Jesus is completed in all respects. There is nothing more to be added to what Jesus has done. And therefore, we say, Good Friday. As I was thinking about it, I was taken to Mark chapter 15, where after all the suffering that Jesus went through, and he was hung on the cross, and after he died, it says, the curtain in the temple was rent into two. And that is the turning point of history, friends. Till then, it was different. But when Jesus said, it is finished, it changed the course of history. It changed what we today believe as the opportunity we have to come into God's holy presence. Before that, it was not so. So it is finished. uh, Tetelstai has changed our approach to God. And that is why we say Good Friday. Until the time when Jesus went to the cross, there were many, many sacrifices that the Jews had to do. Plenty of them. If you go through the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, you will see the various ways in which God wanted them to sacrifice for various aspects of their sin. And it continued. But when Jesus died on the cross, and when he said, it is finished. 
the writer to the hebrews in chapter 10 verse 4 says because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins therefore when christ came into the world he said sacrifice and offerings you did not desire but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased then i said jesus said here i am i have come to do your will o god we see how jesus right from the very beginning had a mission to fulfill right from his childhood we see as we read scripture that he was a very focused person unlike many of us we keep wondering what should be our next venture but jesus was very very focused you know the incident of when jesus uh, was taken to the temple at the age of 12 and his parents came looking for him what was jesus's reply he said don't you know that i should be in my father's house right from that very young age he was a person who knew what his mission was and throughout the gospels as we read jesus talking to various in, on various occasions he keeps mentioning that uh one which i have noted is uh john chapter 6 verse 38 jesus said for i have come down from heaven to do the will of god who sent me not to do my own will and again in john 434 jesus said my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work so we see jesus as a very very focused person he knew what he had to do he knew what his mission on earth was for and he set his heart to doing it it wasn't easy it wasn't an easy right for him not at all but he knew that that was why he came to this earth to give his life as a ransom for many uh so therefore what did jesus mean when he said it is finished i want to look at three aspects of uh, the statement which jesus said it is finished the first one jesus paid off our debt for sin past present and future no sin is outside of god's forgiveness whatever be the situation we are in we know that we can always always go back to him and he will always receive us you know that's the amazing part of the god whom we serve nothing can stop us from going back to him so often in life when we go through crisis we keep wondering whether god will ever receive us back we have been so bad but yet we know that if we go back in all humility jesus is with his everlasting arms will receive us let us never forget that we have a god whom we can always approach whether it be he is one who never sleeps nor slumbers he is always there so whether it is the morning hour the afternoon hour the evening hour the midnight hour or whether we don't sleep at all he is always there to listen to us and may we remember that no sin is outside of god's forgiveness romans 8 uh, verses 1 and 2 says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in christ jesus from the law of sin and death so friends we are not bound by sin all writing to the romans has said sin shall not have dominion over you once we have given our life to christ once we have committed ourselves to him then we don't have to worry about sin sin is there lurking around us but we don't have to be victims of sin all the time sin does not have dominion over us for what christ has done in philip changed it all when he said it is finished hebrews chapter 9 verse 24 to 26 reads like this for christ has entered not into holy places made with human hands which are a copy of the true one in heaven he entered into heaven itself to appear now before god on our behalf and he did not enter heaven to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal if he had be if that had been necessary christ would have to die again and again ever since the world began but now once for all lifetime for all time 
he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. Where do we find such love of a God for mankind? Can we make any comparative study of any person or any character in the Bible who has shown that this is the love of God? Even with all our understanding of Christ, of all that we have gone through in our life, we still fall, fall far short of what God has wanted, wanting us to be. What is our lifestyle? Where do we stand as Christians? We come to church, we sit at every Good Friday service, no harm in that, but does it make an impact? Are we changed? Is there something different? Can this Good Friday, we go back and say, 2024 is a different Good Friday for us. Thirdly, salvation is God's gift to us. Romans 5.15 says, For the sin of this one man, Adam brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Salvation is God's gift. Adam brought death to, the ma to mankind. The sin of one man brought death to the entire history of mankind. But Christ's death on the cross brings forgiveness and restoration of mankind to the living God. We are restored back. We are given back the relationship that we lost when Adam sinned. And that is the greatness of what Jesus has done when he said, it is finished. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it states, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. The Bible very clearly says that whatever we do, Salvation is a free gift from God. It is nothing that we can pay for or achieve by doing things. Sorry. Many other religions teach us that. You have to do so many things to get favor in God's, in God's sight. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, you receive it by faith. It is a gift from God for all of us. And he did it on the cross. And lastly, I would like to say, the validation of the prophetic scriptures. When Jesus said, it is finished, he fulfilled every prophecy about him. Then he said, it is finished. There are, I'm told that there are over 600 prophecies which predict uh, uh, or which point to Jesus Christ and his first coming. Prophecies were made in the Old Testament regarding the Messiah and the New Testament writers often refer to them. Even today, uh, during the course of the many messages that we heard, some of, them were, some of these Old Testament prophecies were referred to. They were all there. And Jesus Christ fulfilled every one of them. There is nothing apart from his second coming. Every single prophecy which was predicted from Genesis to Malachi has been fulfilled by the Lord Jesus, you know. In 1 Peter 1.11 we read, the prophets beforehand spoke of the suffering of Christ and the glory which should follow. From Genesis to Malachi, all point to the truth that Christ would suffer for us. And it has been completed. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was complete. You know, it's amazing what happened when Jesus said it is finished. You remember the story of the centurion who was standing at the foot of the cross. And what did he say? What was his response when Jesus died? Surely this is the son of God. A man who was doing his duty, a soldier who was doing his duty, looked up at Jesus, who saw the whole proceeding of the, of the crucifixion and all that Jesus said, finally could say, Truly, this is the Son of God. Friends, what is our response? In what way does the cross impact us? Have we ever sat down 
and gone through the pain and the suffering of what Jesus went through. I would urge you in this Good Friday, go back and go through the gospel accounts of how Jesus suffered. Go through Isaiah 53 and see what Jesus went through, all for you and for me. You know, we talk about the cross. Good Friday is all about the cross. But what does the cross mean to you and me? Does it have any impact? We just sang the song, The Old Rugged Cross. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Do we cling to the cross? Is it true? Do we sing? The, do we, have you understood what we are singing? The cross changed the course of history, friends. Has it changed our life? You know, when Jesus, when, when the people were following Jesus, he looked back and said, they that want to be my disciples, let him take up the cross and follow me. What did he mean when he said, let him take up the cross and follow me? In those days, the cross was a place of execution. You see that? It is as good as saying today, take up the gallows and follow me. Can we identify that way? Can we say that? This is what the cross is all about. That's what Jesus said. You want to follow me, the way I am going is a way of suffering and death. Are you willing? You know, it was not easy for Jesus. We know how he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane when he pleaded with the Father, if it is possible, take this cup away from me. He knew what it cost him. It's not going to be an easy walk for him. And when we read the rest of the account in the Gospels, I've been reading Mark chapter 15. It's a very painful experience that Jesus went through. In the first song that we sang, we talked about, do we have tears to shed for him? Friends, do we really have tears to shed for him? Or are we just singing songs because they're there? You know? Jesus' life was a life of submission to the Father. In every aspect of his life, he submitted to the will of the Father. He said, I came to do the will of my Father. Nothing more, nothing less. Friends, Jesus finished his mission and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. But what about us? Where are we in our mission for Jesus? May we think a little more seriously on this issue. I would like to close with the words of St. Paul as recorded in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. He writes, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful, and now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. May this Good Friday enable us to make a recommitment, a rededication of our lives to the Lord. Amen. Shall we all stand and sing hymn number 111?
Please be seated. And the seventh word Jesus spoke from the cross is to be found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. And I'm going to read from 44 to 47. Luke, chapter 23, 44 onwards. If you have the Bible, it's in 904. And the reading goes like this. It was about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn into two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this, man, this was a righteous man. Surely this was a righteous man. When Mr. George started his message, he said, it is finished. Just I was looking around, and I saw your faces are glowing. So probably all of you might have thought that it is finished. No, it's not in reality. In reality, it is not it. OK? Still one more thing. It's good that you did not get up, thinking that it is over. I have a lot of time today. It's a wonderful blessing of speaking at the end. Sometimes we don't get anything, so just we'll have to come and pray and go. Sometimes we get a lot of time. Though I have a lot of time, I feel as though I'm crucified. I'm hanging on the cross because whatever I prepared, already it is spoken. Uh, really now I'm confused what to say. If somebody goes through my manuscript, you will surely understand my difficulties. Good. After Jesus saying it is finished, Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's very easy to say that God calls us. If you really feel that God calls us, how many of us can say, yes, Lord, I am ready. Come on, take me. Can any of us say that? Can we say, yes, Lord, I commit my spirit into your hands? How many of us can say? It's very, very difficult. A few days back, one of our old friends came to congratulate me because I became a grandfather. So as we were talking, 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 somehow that topic uh, turned towards the book of Revelation, second coming, corona, so many things. So as we were talking, if God comes today, is it possible to go with him? So the lady, or the, my friend's wife, quickly said, he should not come now. I was a little bit worried. Why? What is the problem? See, I have three children. They are not yet settled. OK? So if he comes, if I'll have to go, what will happen to my three children? So he should not come now. Then I asked her, what would be the right time for him to come? And she said, once I settle down in my life, I commit all my, I complete my, all my commitment, he can come and I go. Then I asked her, OK, by the time you finished your commitment, your children may be in your position. What they would say? 
Then she was looking up and down and she was not able to say anything. Then she said, oh, is it so? So then he cannot come any time. So there is no right time for him to come or for us to go. Isn't it? It's a little difficult. When we read the Bible, the Bible tells us that we are created by God. We are created by God from this earth. And he breathed his breath into our nozzles and we became the living being. We became the living being. Now we have this earthly nature as well as the godly nature in us. When we talk about our body, the body is conditions to health, emotion, senses, feelings, beauty, or ugly, whatever you say. But when we talk about the soul, or the, sorry, the death, a state of unconsciousness. That's what we read in the Bible, unconsciousness. And also it's a state of forgetfulness and silence. When we again read the Bible, I saw something little peculiar. I do not know any time you thought about this or not, but suddenly it uh, struck me only yesterday. Till these many days or years, I did not think in this line at all. The soul can function without the body. That's what we read in the Bible, especially if you turn to Luke chapter 16, there we read about the rich man and the Lazarus. There we read about the rich man staying in hell and the Lazarus in heaven. The soul has its own independent existence. It's a, we read that it can speak. It was speaking to Abraham to send Lazarus to give some water and he could identify Abram. All the things are happening. But we, when we talk about body, and also in most of the movies, we see that, isn't it? The evil spirit or the souls taking revenge. And so many movies are there. The souls have their independent existence. But ever, uh, have you ever come across the body coming out of the grave and having its own existence? No. But soul has. But body never comes out of the grave. In the Bible, we read that there are so many great personalities. They wanted to die before fulfilling God's will in their life. They were very much fed up. They were very much fed up. So they, want, they wanted to die before fulfilling the purpose of God's uh, desire. In Numbers we read, in 11, 31, uh, 13 to 15, Moses had the same problem. Though he was asked to lead the people, he says, Lord, it's enough. I can't do this. Let me die. And if you come to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4, that we read about, uh, I read this verse for you. He says, he prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough. Lord, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. So here we read about the prophet Elijah. He says, he is one of the most powerful prophet in the Bible. But he says, it's enough take me. And we know about Job. He says, Job cursed the day of his birth. He said, why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? And he was telling, that would have been better. And Jeremiah, the prophet, we read about uh, him so much and he says, cursed be the day I was born, the day my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. There are so many prophets. Again, Jonah, we know his story so well. 
Like this, many wanted to die. But they did not die as per their plan or wish or desire. When the time came, they died. Elijah did not die at all. And some people, again in the Bible we read, that they had, a, again, some different uh, type of death, which they did not like at all. They had some plan, but uh, God had some other plan. Again, for example, Moses. There was a time he wanted to die, but God did not take him. But after some time, God said, though he was selected to lead his people, God said, no, you will never enter the promised land. You will never enter the promised land. And like Balaam, the prophet, he wanted to die as a just man, but he died with sinners. And Samson, we know the story of Samson, he died without his vision accomplished. He died in the enemy camp. And like this, we have so many in the Bible. But Jesus had a different death. Actually, when people physically die, they die. But when Jesus died, we read that he bowed down, he adjusted his head so well, and it says he breathed his last. Then he committed his spirit. That means how? When we go to bed, you won't just close your eyes like that. We will adjust the pillow a little bit here and there, isn't it? I do not know whether you ever slept without adjusting the pillow. We always adjust according to our comfort. Then we try to close our eyes. This is what exactly happened in the life of Jesus. He adjusted his head very well and he kept his head in a right position, then he breathed his last. Or, it was not taken from him. It was not taken from him, but he committed. He committed his life to God. If that kind of opportunity, we do not know how many of us would get. But if we get, what would we say? Will we be able to say that, Lord, I commit my spirit unto your hand? Jesus was a good orator. He, could, he can speak very good message and people also commanded by saying that, how did he get this authority? He can speak to thousands of people without any manuscript in his hands. He could speak. But this was, I commit my spirit is not his own. It is taken from Psalm. It's taken from Psalm. It's a tradition of the Jewish community. Before they go to bed, everyone said this prayer. It's a prayer saying that, Lord, I commit my spirit unto your hand. It's a very surety behind this verse. We all know when we go to bed, we plan very well. As soon as we get up tomorrow morning, what should I do? We don't know whether we get up or not. That is a different thing, absolutely. I'm not talking about it. But we are very confident what we would be doing the very next day. The moment we get up, what we do, then what are the other works we'll have to do. Everything is well planned. So when we say, I commit my life, it is not the end. It's very we are very sure that morning we'll get up. That is the confidence of Jesus also. Though I commit my spirit, it is not the end. With that confidence, he committed his life. If you read Psalm 31, verse 5, you will read this. I commit my spirit. It's taken from Psalm 31, 5. There are so many people, if you read the history, 
so many people said that uh, I commit my spirit unto your hands. But the, did, the death did not come to them immediately. After that, what happened, we don't know. But in the history, it is said that the final words of Polycarp, Bernard, Luther, Jerome, John Huss, all these people, before their death, they said these words, it seems. But I'm not very sure whether the moment they said these words, they died or again, they lived for a few minutes or for a few hours. When we talk about the death, if you read First Peter, chapter 3, verse 18, that we read, he died of his own free will. That's what I wanted to try to tell you in the beginning. He gave his spirit or committed his spirit into God's hands. Nobody has taken it. Nobody has taken it. As I have told you already, the life is given to us by God. It is like Jesus talking about the talent. In the book of uh, Luke, again, we read that. It says that there was a rich man. He gave five talent to somebody, three to someone. We know the story so well. Our life is also given to us like a talent to be used in the right manner. As the king came and asked, what did you do with my talent or the gold which I gave? God also would ask us, what did you do with the life which I gave you? Because the breath which we have is his gift. That is why in the Bible we read that in Ecclesiastes, it says, the dust returns to the ground it came from and the spirit returns to God who gave it. The Bible is very clear. The body, the flesh, after our death, it returns to this earth. But the spirit, it has come from God. So it goes to God. It should go to God. But it may not go to God also. Why? That I want to share with you today. Let us take the illustration which already I shared about the rich man. Jesus said, I commit my life unto your hands. It's good. But when the rich man died, the Bible tells us he did not go to heaven. He did not go, the soul did not go to God. It went to hell. That is not the purpose of God giving us our breathing into our nozzle. The spirit is supposed to go to God. If it is not, when he comes, surely he will ask, I gave you a wonderful talent. How did you use it? Why, after using it, it did not come back to me? Why it did not come back to me? We call this as Good Friday. Why? Because Jesus died so that we can die for these sins. All the sins of this world, he has taken up on his head. That is why he died. If our spirit is not ready or it doesn't go to heaven, the purpose of his sacrificial death is gone. The purpose is lost. What we are doing is like the man who took the gold or the talent from him and dug a hole on the earth and put it there. That's all. It's of no use. How do we use the life which God has given to us? Whether it will go to heaven or not. If it is not going to heaven, it's of no use at all. In the Bible, we read that all the scripture is given to us for nourishment, to encourage us when we come to the church to meditate upon the seven verse. How do we go back? Is it because of our tradition we should sit here for three hours 
listen to various preachers and go back without any effect and we'll come back next year? Is it the reason people call us ECG Christian? Easter, Christmas, only Good Friday? Are we coming to the church only for that? Or we are coming here to equip our soul to reach heaven? Sometimes we come because it is our tradition. If we do not go to the church on Good Friday, we are not good Christians. So we come. Today, I do not know what is your intention. Whatever your intention it may be. Maybe you are a traditional Christian or you are the only one who come only on Good Friday to the church. But keep all the messages which you heard in your mind. If we cannot commit our spirit unto God's hand, the whole life would be lost. Probably every year we may be attending the Good Friday, but it will have no meaning for us at all. So we need to be a little serious about it. It's very easy to come and sit. And somebody was asking me, is it necessary to observe all these kind of services? Is it necessary to observe Good Friday service? Even when we observe Good Friday service and other traditional things, we do not be touched by the messages. If you do not have this kind of opportunities, do you think that we will ever think of God and his sacrifice? We need to think. When we think about all the things, at least by God's grace, some of us may be touched. When we are touched by God's word, then we try to do something better in our life. In the Bible we read that let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When we attend these kind of services, really it encourages us to do something good, something greater than what we are doing. So, others may see light. Others may see light. Today, Christianity is not at all accepted. Every day we get some WhatsApp message here and there. That church is broken. This church is broken. That missionary is attacked. This missionary is attacked. How do we live? Why they are not able to accept us? Do they see light or the flavor, salt in us? If really we make flavor to the world, how somebody can hate us? How somebody can attack the worship place where we come to worship? How do we live? Can this world see the light? When they can see the light. When we are prepared to com commit our life to God, when we really very confident, Lord, I am ready, my soul is prepared, you can take my life, and that kind of situation, only this world would know that we are his children. We will be a useful vessel in his hands. As long as we are just a traditional Christians having a name of name from the scripture and have some Christian names, it is not going to help anybody. Now it will help anybody. When Jesus was born, the, the angels sang, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. We have completed 2,000 years. Jesus shed his blood 2,000 years back. Till today, we are not able to establish peace, forget about the world, among the churches, among our own church. How this world would accept you and me. If we, not, we do not have peace in our own church, how can we glorify God? How it would bring glory to God? That is why today we are thrown out like a salt which has lost its flavor. As we celebrate 
or observe this Good Friday. Let us think of our life. God has graciously given this life to you and me. Three years back, we know how much we went through tension and suffering. The churches or the worship places were closed. Today, God has graciously given us this opportunity to come to this holy sanctuary to worship him. If the time comes, if God comes today, can we meet him? If death comes before God, can we tell, Lord, I am ready, take my life. I am ready to commit my life. If it is not so, let us prepare ourselves. Let us come to the Lord and bow down before him and confess all our sinful nature. God is so gracious. He can any time accept you and me. There is no rest restriction. The moment we move towards him, he would welcome us with open hands. He would hug us and he would give us a new life. With this meditation, let us conclude this Good Friday service. Let us always remember, God has given us this life as gift, as a talent which was given to the various people. Let us use this talent in the right way. When we use it in the right way, his name will be glorified and the purpose of his crucifixion or the sacrificial death from the cross of Calvary would be fulfilled and we can continue to have a peaceful and comfortable life. God bless you. Shall we all sing the hymn which is given in the sheet, the story of the cross? Please be seated or kneel down when we sing this hymn.
us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which you offer before thee for all estates of men in thy holy church, that every member of the same in his vocation and ministry may truly and godly serve thee through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we all join together in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you, remain with you always. Let us depart in peace to love and serve the Lord.